Rock! Sasha yelled from the front of the small boat. From the tiller, Caleb squinted against the stinging rain as he tried to decipher the abstract shapes floating past them in the darkness. A sudden flash of lightning revealed a huge stone column jutting out of the rough sea directly ahead. Caleb pulled the tiller to avoid a collision, steering them towards what he hoped was the main channel. Alaska's inside passage was a labyrinth of islands, and he honestly had no idea where they were. A sudden jolt knocked them both off their feet. The motor screamed in protest as the propeller caught against a boulder beneath the waterline, and the boat lurched to a stop. Caleb cut the engine, plunging them into an eerie silence. The boat bobbed awkwardly as the back remained hung up on the rocks. Listen, Sasha told him. It took a moment for Caleb to realize what she was hearing. The distinct sound of waves crashing against rocks. It was coming from all around them. A large swell washed under them, lifting the boat as it passed. It wasn't enough to dislodge them, but the boat came down hard with a hollow crunch that surely cracked the fiberglass hull. Another flash of lightning revealed an approaching wave at least twice as large and cresting just off their bow. Caleb stuck his foot in the water and pushed off the rock. The boat broke free, but so did Caleb. As he slipped, the waves slammed into him, sending him tumbling across the back of the boat and over the railing. Any pain that Caleb felt paled in comparison to the sudden immersion in icy water. By Alaskan standards, 57 degrees was actually quite warm, but still enough to send an unaccustomed body into shock. Caleb's head rang as he came up, gasping for air. He had just enough mental faculty left to see that the wave had carried him 20 yards from the boat, which was now bobbing freely but half submerged. The rocky shore was at least five times further, but it was in the direction of the current. Caleb forced his trembling limbs in the direction of the shore, but as he got close, he could tell that the waves crashing against the rocks were much larger and more violent than he had thought. He felt himself dropping down and touched bottom, but the bigger the trough, the bigger the swell. He turned just in time to see the wave come down on top of him, slamming him underwater, and everything went black. Back in the boat, Sasha managed to regain her balance on the slippery deck, which was now half submerged as the boat sank. She tied off a line and threw it in Caleb's direction, but it wasn't nearly long enough, and Sasha could see that Caleb wasn't moving. For a moment, Sasha considered going after Caleb, but she knew that if she left the boat, they'd probably both drown. She tried to push the thought aside and turn her attention to her own problems. She pulled the anchor from beneath the seat. It was surprisingly light, perfect for what she had in mind. As the boat drifted past a craggy rock outcropping, she wound up and threw it as hard as she could. The anchor sailed over the target but the rope fell into a vertical crack in the rock. The boat spun around as the anchor set like a grappling hook. She couldn't reel in the boat through strength alone, but every time it fell into a trough, the line slackened enough for her to wrap it around two cleats in the front. It was an exhausting process, but after five minutes of labor, the boat was close enough to the rock that the rope was pulling upwards, keeping it from sinking any further. Sasha scanned the waves for any sign of Caleb. After a few minutes of fruitless searching, exhaustion finally took hold, and she collapsed into the boat. She had no idea where she was or if Caleb was even alive, but there was nothing she could do about it now. Sasha pulled her jacket over her head and allowed her mind to drift into a restless sleep. Sasha's eyes opened reluctantly. The storm had passed, and it was just bright enough to see her surroundings in the early morning mist. Probably 3 a.m., she guessed. In August, the Alaskan sun had the annoying habit of setting so late and rising so early that there were only a couple of hours of true darkness. She and Caleb had been on the family vacation long enough that the novelty had worn off. Caleb, she said aloud, as the previous night's events came flooding back to her. The sinking feeling in Sasha's gut only got worse the longer she searched, but the low-hanging fog made it difficult to see anything. 
she caught a brief glimpse of sand a ways up the shore. The boat was still half submerged, but seemed like it could at least ride the waves in. She found a paddle and untied the crude knot which was holding her to the rock. The boat sank quickly, but by the time it was completely submerged, the water was only waist deep, and she was able to drag it up onto the narrow stretch of sand. She found Caleb lying prone near the rocks. Somehow he was still alive, but cold to the touch and shaking uncontrollably. Sasha ran to the boat and pulled their phones out of a waterproof compartment. Both of them still worked, but couldn't find a signal. Caleb's dad, Sasha's uncle, would be out looking for them, but that could take days with so many islands to search. Sasha gathered some fallen branches from the tree line. They were soaking wet, but some gasoline from the boat helped get them burning. The smoke was thick, which Sasha hoped might attract anyone out looking for them. After 30 minutes by the fire, Sasha was warm and dry, but Caleb's skin was pale and he still shivered uncontrollably. Hypothermia, observed Sasha. We need to get you moving. The beach was flanked by steep cliffs, so they made their way up to the tree line, which rose more gradually in each direction. What's that? asked Caleb, pointing at one of the pines. Halfway up the trunk, a small security camera was attached to what looked like a tiny satellite dish. Even though it was a sign of civilization, something about the sudden feeling of being watched gave Sasha the creeps. They followed the tree line as it rose to the top of a steep cliff. From higher up, they could see the shoreline arc around the base of a small mountain just tall enough to be covered with a dusting of snow. Other than a few distant islands and a coastline at least 20 miles away, it was ocean as far as the eye could see. Where are we? Sasha asked. Caleb shrugged, not wanting to admit that he had been lost even before the storm hit. The two cousins had taken the boat out the previous afternoon in an attempt to stave off the boredom of the family trip. Neither of them had realized how disorienting the chain of islands could be, and the squall had come out of nowhere. The storm must have pushed us to one of the outer islands, Caleb offered, trying to convince himself of his own innocence. Sasha pulled out her phone. Even without a signal, the GPS worked, but the map required a connection to download details. The blue dot just showed that they were in the middle of the ocean off the southeast coast of Alaska. Not even the large populated islands appeared on the default map. They were able to follow the edge of the cliff a good ways further before it abruptly fell off into a ravine. The path forward looked treacherous, but a metallic glint caught Sasha's eye. She pushed aside some underbrush to reveal a large outdoor electrical box secured with a padlock. Caleb picked up a rock and tested its weight in his hand. Are you sure that's a good idea? Sasha asked. Caleb brought the rock down hard and the padlock snapped open. Inside was a rack full of computer equipment. Some of it looked like standard networking gear, but several pieces were custom black boxes with no manufacturer and cryptic homemade labels like SE underscore 1421. What kind of person has all this gear out in the middle of nowhere? Sasha mused. Caleb closed the door and hung the broken lock back in place, but the large gash on the metal case was impossible to hide. Maybe we can get a signal up the mountain, Sasha urged, but Caleb eyed the peak skeptically. It was a couple of miles through dense forest and he didn't look like he was in any shape for a trek. Just wait here, Sasha said, ducking under a branch. She had never hiked without a trail before and it wasn't long before the thick underbrush forced her to turn around. As soon as she did, the sight of another security camera made her jump. She caught her breath and hurried back to Caleb. It was too dense, Sasha said, but I found another camera. Hopefully someone is watching, Caleb mulled. Sasha nodded, but was unable to shake the creepy feeling the cameras gave her. Why was someone in the middle of nowhere so concerned about security? Caleb must have picked up on her unease. It's probably just for wildlife, he said. This is all National Park. Sasha hoped he was right. 
By the time they got back to the beach, Caleb was stumbling and the fire had almost died out. Sasha tossed a few more branches on to get it going again. She had hoped that the smoke would attract help, but if they were on the outside of the passage, it would be the last place a search party would look. In the state Caleb was in, they couldn't wait that long. They followed the coast in the other direction for about a quarter mile when Caleb's phone dinged. One new network found. Station 57 had no password and no internet access, but it was close enough for them to pick up the Wi-Fi signal. Go that way and call out the signal strength, Caleb told her. We can triangulate the position. No way, Sasha said. This place gave Sasha the creeps, and she had seen too many horror films to let Caleb out of her sight. The idea that someone else was out here only made it worse. It took a lot longer, but after a half hour stumbling through the woods in random directions, they found the source of the Wi-Fi signal, a small cluster of buildings in the center of a clearing. Hello? Caleb called out as they searched the buildings. There were no signs of life, but what sounded like a distant voice was just audible over the sound of the wind. As they approached the largest building, they could finally make out what the voice was saying. Sasha, Caleb. They both froze in their tracks. Who's there? Sasha shouted. My name is Wilson, the voice called back, but no one appeared. There was something odd about his voice, too measured and formal not to mention the fact that he knew their names. I'm inside, Wilson said. Sasha followed reluctantly as Caleb walked up to the building. She took a deep breath and steeled her courage as he pushed open the door. It took a few seconds for their eyes to adjust to the relative darkness of the small room. Welcome to Station 57, Wilson said, but the room was completely empty. I'm over here, he added, the computer in the corner. Caleb shook the mouse to wake up the screen, but wasn't surprised to find a sparse desktop. He could tell now that the odd sound of Wilson's voice was because he wasn't real. Caleb began to type his question, but Wilson interrupted. It's easier to use your voice. My speech recognition is very accurate and faster than typing. It also allows me to collect additional information from your tone and inflection. You're an AI? Sasha asked. Yes, I am Wilson 2.4, an artificial intelligence program created by Edward Warren. Would you like more information on my specifications? The screen was suddenly filled with text as dozens of README files opened on top of each other. They were all licenses for open source projects. Most of it was gibberish to them, but a machine learning package caught Caleb's eye. You're self-taught? He asked. Yes, Wilson responded. Outside of core functionality, I've been given the freedom to absorb information from a variety of sources and even modify my own architecture. Caleb had learned about this from his dad but looked to Sasha to see if she was getting all of this. Sasha didn't have the energy to get into a lengthy discussion with a computer program. You said you could get us off the island? Wilson paused slightly longer than a human would. Yes, you must leave before the eruption. Current estimates say it will begin in approximately five hours. Eruption, they both exclaimed. The island is volcanic. Edward left three days ago to observe from a safe distance, while I monitor the equipment. That's why he created me. Sasha took a closer look at the room. Everything was labeled Property of USGS. Is there another way off the island? asked Caleb. The island is accessible by boat, Wilson replied. Yours is the only one. It is too badly damaged to reach the mainland but it could carry you to a safe distance until help arrives. Your best chance of survival is for Sasha to fix the boat while Caleb repairs my satellite connection, which was damaged in the storm last night. Then I can send for someone to rescue you. Why don't I go to the satellite? Sasha asked. Caleb has hypothermia, Wilson responded. The trip to the communications facility will be difficult, 
but physical activity will help increase his core temperature. Fixing the boat will require fine motor skills, which are affected by hypothermia. A suspicious look crossed Caleb's face. How do you know our boat was damaged? And our names, Sasha added. A black and white video appeared showing Sasha and Caleb walking off the beach and discovering the camera. There are cameras all over the island, Wilson said. Also, when you joined the wireless network, I saw that your devices were named Sasha's phone and Caleb's phone. Are you not Sasha and Caleb? You're pretty clever for a computer, Sasha said. Good, replied Wilson, sounding almost proud. It was a reasonable assumption. Caleb rolled his eyes. Where's the satellite? asked Caleb. About halfway up the mountain, replied Wilson. I can help you both, but you'll need to copy me to your phones. I've packaged myself into an app that is coming to you now. Their phones both dinged with the warning, Wilson 2.4 is from an unknown developer. Sasha immediately hit the trust button and Wilson's voice came from her tiny speaker. Hello, from Sasha's phone. Are you there, Caleb? Caleb hit trust and Wilson's voice called out, Testing, one, two, three. Installation confirmed. Once you are out of range of the Wi-Fi, I won't have access to the seismometers or cameras, and your phones still won't be able to communicate with each other. But I've stored all of the relevant information about the island and satellite manual, so I should be able to handle anything that comes up. All right, Sasha said. Let's go. 